Project Sponsored Quest Course, Land Use Planning, Understanding the Pieces of the Puzzle. And I'd like to extend a welcome to the students that are with us this week because it's a new group of students and we're glad you could be here. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Marsha Meslonic. She is with the Three Rivers Habitat Partnership. They're a regional project of the Wildlife Habitat Council and their goal is to work with corporations and private landowners to help them manage land for habitat for wildlife. So please welcome Marsha. Okay, I see we've got a, quite a variety of people here tonight, so that's uh, exciting. I like to, to talk to everybody from youngsters and high school kids to uh, other people. <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? No, no, no. <laughs> and people older than high school students, how's that? <laughs> All right, we'll get this going for you. There we go. Okay, and as you said, my name's Marsha, and I'm with the Wildlife Habitat Council. And we're a nonprofit organization who is, works internationally, mainly with corporations, to help them manage their land for wildlife habitat. But we also work with other landowners as well, such as townships, and particularly here in Pittsburgh, I, I work a lot with individuals, parks and township property, and even schools and other people. Basically, what you can do on a corporate property to enhance it for wildlife, you can do anywhere. And so I'm going to use my experience to talk a little bit about that today. Well, first of all, whenever we think about conserving land, we often think of uh, what are some of the wild places that you think of whenever you think of wildlife in big open spaces? Something must come to mind. Yes. Alaska? National Park? Exactly. State parks, that's what we all think of, and that's normal. However, imagine if the only habitat that we conserved in our own state, let's say, was national, state, and local parks. Imagine that that was the only place where you could go out and find wetlands and forests and fields. And then close your eyes and imagine your own neighborhood full of nothing but houses and pavement. Not a pretty picture, is it? No, but that's how a lot of us approach conservation. We don't realize that it needs to start in our backyard and it needs to start in our own community. And that's what I uh, promote, is going out there and getting habitat. I say, show me the habitat instead of show me the money. And this particular picture right here, I love this picture. Guess what this picture was taken at? A landfill, an active landfill out in California. And there actually, there is an endangered butterfly on this property that they had to mitigate for. They had to make sure there was habitat for it. But they went above and beyond and created more habitat than they had to. They even created nurseries for the plant species that this butterfly depended upon for it. And this is one of those areas. It's a very rare type of habitat called a serpentine barren out in California. And this is being managed by these people. And thank goodness that private landowners are willing to do this. Sometimes they need a little nudge, and that's what we're there for. Sometimes they're just waiting for somebody to come along and help them and show them how to do this. And it's the same thing right here in your township. The Three Rivers Habitat Partnership is the name of the regional project here in Pittsburgh that I manage. And it's, it's basically we work with about 20 corporate sites in southwestern Pennsylvania. We work with a number of PPG sites Rick Jacobs is here from PPG, who I work with on, on his site. We also work with U.S. Steel, Bear Corporation, and other companies as well, such as Dominion. And we help them do these things on their property. And more importantly, we help the employees do these things. We don't go in and do it for them. We don't go in and plant the trees and monitor the bluebird trails. We show them why and how to do it. So this is a great outreach to people who live in this community. And then we use these projects as demonstrations to other landowners about how to do this. We'll offer workshops, we'll pair up with the schools and reach out that way. So it's a nice network of habitat that gets going. Well, I don't think I have to ask this question to this audience, but not knowing exactly who all would be here and, and your background, we often have to ask ourselves, can we have parks 
that are for people and for wildlife? The answer is yes, yes that's right. We should. Now, this is an area where uh, ignorance isn't always bliss. If you don't know what you're doing or you don't know how to create a good habitat, you're not necessarily, you might actually be causing harm instead of good. So it, it helps to have a lot of people come together and look at your plans and, and integrate habitat into these parks. And we have uh, worked with a number of corporations in other areas that develop parks. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of AMD and Art Vintendale site. I see a couple hands, heads shaking. It's a wonderful site. We actually worked with them. And this is a schematic of it where they, it was quite ugly. It was abandoned mine lands that had a lot of uh, acid mine drainage trickling through this flag cow. They turned it into a treatment system for the acid mine drainage and also a wetland area and habitat and park for the people. So it was a lovely demonstration of how you can do many things at one time. You remediate the site, you attract wildlife, and you attract people too. It's a great park right in the uh, middle of this tiny little town. Um, off of 22, and we help them with the wetland design and those sorts of things. We've also worked with other sites, um, just now beginning to work with some townships. Emmerling Park, which is Indiana Township, we're helping put in a uh, riparian buffer garden alongside Deer Creek, and it'll be a nice kind of formalist garden using native plants in the understory of this area, and will be integrated into the park. We're also creating a nature park with Crofton, which is uh, right across from Fox Chapel High School, to where we'll be trying to engage the children and the young families, as well as the other residents in this nature park to uh, some great things. And we're also working with Beaver County to help them with some riparian uh, buffer demonstration garden. So we're, we're glad that it's catching on. And we have more than just corporations that we're working with, because there's a great need out there for it and I'm just more than happy to uh, oblige. And let me just say, if you have any questions or comments along the way, just blurt it out, okay? <laughs> Good. All right, well, let's look at what we can do, because that's what I was asked to talk about, the habitats and how we can integrate parks and habitat together. We'll start with wetlands, because I know that's all near and dear to you, and you probably know a lot of this, so ask questions along the way, or um, if there's something else you wanna talk about. One of our examples is, U.S. Steel, South Taylor Environmental Park, here's a site that was basically a big flag cow, but they had wetlands on site that they then enhanced for wildlife. And in particular, you see quite a few different things there. Now, what are some of the things that you know of when it comes to designing wetlands that you should do to really make it inviting for wildlife? Anybody have any ideas? No? Okay. That's okay. I'll tell you. <laughs> What's that? Shelter? That's right. Well, let's, let's go. Let's back up a step. Let's look at all these habitats in the terms of what wildlife needs. What does wildlife need? Four things. You said one of them. Shelter, food, water, and space. That's the one everybody forgets, is space. And it's very easy for us to forget about it right here. And unfortunately, that's the limiting factor for a lot of species, is space. I always tell kids, does a polar bear need as much space as a mouse? No, it needs a heck of a lot more space than a mouse. So we have to consider that because habitats in our neck of the woods can attract a lot of different species, but it can't attract everything. We're never gonna have timber wolves here. We're never gonna have red wolves back. And we're probably never gonna have mountain lions back right here in this area because there's just not enough space for them as far as habitat goes. So that's very important. So anytime you're targeting, uh, let's see, a particular species, or let's say you want to attract hummingbirds even, you have to look at those four needs. They can be as simple as that, and that's what we're gonna look at here. So we have a wetlands, or you have a wetlands, and you wanna do something more with it, what can we do? Quite a few things. First of all, whenever you design wetlands, and let me jump ahead here, it is great uh, <laughs> actually to have islands in the middle of your wetlands. This is a simple thing that whenever you're constructing or enhancing wetlands, it's simple to do. You create little hummocks or you mound up dirt in the middle of it, and what does that provide for wildlife? It provides shelter and space for lots of waterfowl and other species to nest. Because there they are in the middle of water, which acts as a little moat to a lot of predators that might come and eat their nest. So islands are a very simple thing, uh, and it creates edges. An edge is where two different habitats or two types of ecotones come together, where you have, let's see, a wetland and the grassy area on the island come together. That's an edge. 
and lots of different types of critters are going to live there. Not just big critters, little critters, insects, uh, mayfly larvae, etc., are going to be able to find shelter under the water where that grass needs. And that, guess what? That's food for other animals. So that's very important. Undulating shores. This is probably my favorite one because when I work with corporations, I oftentimes work with a lot of engineers. And what do we know about any, any engineers in here? <laughs> what do we know about engineers? They get out. I got a roller or something. They like those straight lines, and they see somebody like me coming in there. Ah! Because I'm like, no, no, get throw away your roller. Wildlife. If you look in nature, you will hardly ever, if ever, find a straight line. And we should realize that that means something important. And for wildlife, if you create a wetland, and I've seen this done, so I'm not just making this up, they created a big box. It was a big rectangle, and it was their wetland. And I was like, oh, geez. You can get some species in there, but it's not that great. But if you take that same perimeter of the wetlands and you undulate it, like make little S's, make little nooks and crannies, you are making little micro habitats in that wetland for things to live and find shelter from insects that are going to live there and find shelter there to amphibians such as frogs and salamanders to basically providing them little apartment-like areas. So it's very important to undulate the shorelines and, and make it really neat and uh, to them. I guess you could say it'd be messy to an engineer. But that is what you're going to find in nature. It's going to uh, attract the most types of uh, species. And this is a nice, wet, this is a natural wetland. It's a Pine Barrens area in New Jersey. And you can see those things demonstrated in that picture. Also, diversity. Diversity, diversity, diversity is the greatest thing that you can do for wildlife and habitats in this area. How many of you have went by wetlands and what did you see? What was the main thing that you saw in the wetlands? Cattails. You'll see entire beds of nothing but cattails. And cattails are good for wildlife. There is a type of, um, it's a narrow leaf cattail that really isn't native to this area that tends to take over at the expense of other plants, which is why a lot of our wetlands in this area um, don't resemble what they may have 100, 200 years ago and don't have all the diversity. This is a, a great wetland to show you. This is not the narrow leaf cattail, it's a different type, and it's interspersed with all sorts of other wetland plants, and that big shrub there is called button bush. So here you see at least four or five different species right in the front of this picture. So if you're creating a wetland and you're starting from scratch or let's say you've enhanced it a little bit and dug it out so that you have different depths, you should try and see native species that would be found in that particular habitat in there. And if you have a diversity of species in a wetland, you're also going to attract a diversity of plant species, you're going to attract more wildlife species as well from pollinators, which we'll be talking about in depth in a bit, uh, to songbirds, to amphibians, and so forth. Different communities look different, but in general, the more types of plants you can have that are native, the better it's going to be. Unfortunately, that's not the case in our natural world right now because of all the impacts that we have had on this. And actually, let me talk about one other thing. What's one big thing I didn't mention when we're talking about wetland enhancement that I'm sure some of you know about? What must we control? Invasive. That's right. Invasive species. I talked about native. I didn't talk about invasive. Do we all know what native versus invasive is? I think most of you do, but just in case there are a few that don't, native plants are plant species or animals that have been here before settlers came over. They were here in nature, naturally. <laughs> invasive plants and invasive animals were brought over by people, either accidentally or on purpose. And if you bring over something and you put it in a different habitat, one of two things are going to happen. Or let's say one of three things are going to happen. One, it's not going to do well. Let's say it's too cold, it's too warm, so it'll die. No problem. We never know it ever happens. Number two, eh, it can survive and it can do all right and it'll just stay in limited pockets and not create too much of a problem. Or it'll spread a little bit, but it doesn't take over. Number three is our problem. That's when an invasive plant or animal comes in and it loves it here and it just takes over and does so wonderfully well that you see house sparrows everywhere. And we think of them as just a part of our world. But they take over to the extent they're just so aggressive and they, they can live here so well that they harm other species that were here before them and they end up dying off. 
that's why invasive plants and animals are a very, very big issue that you just cannot ignore. A lot of people say, let nature take its course. Unfortunately, if you let nature take its course today without doing anything, it's probably going to end up not doing so well. It might be okay. You'll get some, you'll get some wildlife, but it won't be, it won't reach its maximum potential. So that's where you got to learn that sometimes spraying Roundup is the right thing to do if you know what you're doing and you use the right, you use Roundup or Rodeo. Sometimes controlling a wildlife species such as a house sparrow is the thing to do. And a lot of people don't want to hear that, but if you want to look at what's best for the ecosystem right here in the area, you're going to have to get real with it and think about, okay, what are my objectives, what can we do, and what are we going to do? So it's good that I brought that up now before later. <laughs> All right. Now, there are different types of wetlands just besides the ones I showed you before. There are forested wetlands. There are emergent wetlands. There are one of my favorite wetlands, vernal pools. Have any of you ever seen vernal pools around here? Have you ever located a few? A few of you have. Just two out of everybody here? Three, four, okay. Vernal pools are shallow pools of water, usually in the middle of the forest, that are temporary. Uh, the best ones, they'll fill up with water when the snow melts in January and February, and it'll hold water. Just This is a picture taken in February. And it'll hold water there for, let's say, 60 to 90 days. Some will dry up beforehand, some will last longer and it doesn't look like anything greater than this. Now, if you went walking through the woods and you saw that, you might think, oh, cool, and that's it, right? Have any of you ever thought that? <laughs> All right, great. Well, somebody like me gets in there <laughs> who likes amphibians, and we're like, wow, let's come back to this. Let's keep coming back, because this is a hotbed for biodiversity. It is a hotbed for amphibians, or it should be, hopefully will be anyways, because there are lots of species that will live that require vernal pools for breeding. If they don't have vernal pools, they will not survive. This is one critter. This is a marbled salamander. And many of our mole salamanders require vernal pools for breeding. There's also different toads and frogs that require or use vernal pools. Wood frogs, um, uh, let's see, there's a toad that uses it that needs it. A lot of species will use it that will also breed other, otherwise, but there are some that will only breed in these vernal pools. Even little clams, fingernail clams, and shrimps and such. So it's this whole neat little ecosystem wrapped up in this tiny little area that most of us take for granted. And guess what happens if development comes into that wooded area? I saw this happen. I grew up uh, just down the road in McMurray. And the woods that I used to, to play in and love, I'm very, very saddened to say they're gone. There's housing plans on them. And there was a lovely vernal pool at the one spot that when I was six, well, all the way up until not that long ago, <laughs> I would go running to and check out because it was uh, full of these little critters. And unfortunately, it's hard to convince people that those innocuous looking wetlands are actually wetlands deserving of protection. But if we don't protect them, we're gonna lose a whole suite of species that depend upon them. So vernal pools are very important to first identify, know where they're at, and then protect. Yes. Yes. And what I was going to talk about next was the actual wetlands. If okay, a good example. Going back to my childhood once again, is right across the street from where I grew up was a floodplain along Chartier's Creek. Great floodplain, right? It would flood in the spring, like all floodplains do. And uh, there was a bittern that I've seen down there. There's a heron rookery very nearby. Great area. Well, what did somebody decide to do just uh, 10 years or so ago? They decided to put a soccer field in. So now this floodplain is a soccer field, and it also has a big housing development now, too. So what happens in the spring? It floods. That's right. And guess what else happens? There's a lot of geese that go in there because of the, the conditions, and the kids are complaining about the geese and such, but they pick the poor area to put it in. So you, have to, you can't just put a wetland right next to a soccer field it's not going to make anybody very happy. Uh, and plus, you're not going, if you're looking at it from our standpoint, you're not going to be protecting the wildlife that lives there. A buffer is very important to have around any body of water. And I'll talk a little bit about that more. But uh, wetlands are no different than a stream. You should have a buffer. Depending on the slope, depending on the area, and depending on what's going on next door, that buffer can vary anywhere between 50 feet and 300 feet. But this is what I always tell people, 
a little buffer is better than no buffer at all. So even 25 foot is better than nothing. And unfortunately, you see no buffer lots of times around wetlands or whatnot. So if you have an area where you're going to have a wetland and you're going to have active recreation like a soccer field or such, it is very good to try and decide, okay, how can we plan this? Can we put the soccer field closer to an upland area where there's you know, not much going on? Can we cr create a buffer in between here and there? And, and I'll talk about what that buffer could be in a second as well. Does that answer your question? Or just comment, yeah. Right, right, right. And th that's the same with any type of habitat as well. And we'll see if we can get into that. Oh, one thing, this is a kind of cute picture. Um, but when it comes to, when we're talking about vernal pools and amphibians and, and wetlands, these guys need shelter. Uh, a lot of our amphibians right now are heading out or already in hibernation. And they often will hibernate under uh, leaf litter, under deep under the ground. And lots of times they'll use big rock piles. If you can actually build what's called an amphibian hibernaculum nearby, it's a neat way to create shelter for them to, uh, to actually hibernate over the winter, as well as sometimes they'll use it during the summer and such to hide in, depending on, on what you're doing. This is not an amphibian hibernaculum. This is just a little pile of rock, just to demonstrate what can be done anywhere and even in the yard. Uh, it provides shelter. I've got a toad that literally hangs out there every summer. Um, but you also might attract snakes or other little critters that are going to come in there, hang out there, wait for food to come by. They're going to come up on the rocks if they're a snake and kind of bask in the sunshine and warm up. And for those of you who don't like snakes, what's that snake going to do after he warms up? He's not going to come bite you. He's going to go eat a cricket or he's going to eat a mouse or something like that. So he's going to provide a real good service for you in your garden. But rocks, you can pile them up in a small pile in your garden. You can also pull, pile them up on a larger scale in your habitat. And I have actually big rock piles in my yard where uh, foxes will actually use as a den and other types of critters will. These things I'm talking about um, not only are good for wildlife, they're also good economically in many cases. There is, uh, let me, what was the company? Oh, it was Hewlett Packard, which is my computer, who actually found a unique way to save $20,000. They had all these rocks they were going to haul out. Instead of haul, spending $20,000 to haul out rocks, they decided to build them up into big, uh, uh, not like brush piles, but rock piles for wildlife and put them in some wild areas and, that's a, a, and actually providing a lot of benefit to wildlife. So these things can make sense, too, economically. Snags are crucial. Snags are dead trees that are dead or dying, and they're good for so many different types of species. It's unbelievable. In wetlands, you oftentimes see them. They're also good in upland areas. There are, we'll talk a little bit about some cavity nesting songbirds at the very end, but they provide hiding places, places to actually raise their young for birds of prey, like screech owls use cavities. That's all they use. Kestrels will use cavities in upland areas. Uh, and one of my favorites are bats. On the, your right-hand side, you'll see that bark that's kind of sloughing off of that dead tree. That's a great place for bats to go in and, and hang out under there. It, how many of you in here like bats? Good, OK, most of you. <laughs> I won't go into too much then about that. All I have to say is look at those eyes. So many times I talk to people, and they're, they're even if they don't admit it, they're a little bit hesitant about bats. And, they're one of my favorite uh, critters to, to talk about and work with. This is a red bat, which is a tree bat. This is a type of bat that will not use a bat box, but will only use uh, uh, trees that have foliage on it. So not all bats can be attracted to bat boxes, but he demonstrates just how cute they can be. And they're very beneficial because a little brown bat in one hour alone, he'll eat about 400 to 600 insects in an hour. You multiply that by, let's say, a small colony of 20 little brown bats, you got a lot of insects. You multiply that by six hours of feeding overnight, and you've just got yourself a lot of insects out of there. So bats are a great thing to manage for in any wetland ecosystem, as well as in your backyard or along streams or waterways. They do bat boxes are a great thing to uh, put up. They're easy to do, so I, I always implement it. If you do it right, you have about an 80% chance of attracting bats. If you don't do it right, you have a very little chance of attracting bats. But I can tell you all about that if you're interested. Um, they can be erected on the sides of barns, buildings, facing southeast is the best direction. In our area, your bat box really must be black or a very dark color. 
to attract bats because of the temperature. They require um, a, a nurse, a colony, a maternity colony of bats requires at least 90 degrees inside there to uh, make it warm enough for their pups, which are born naked and hairless. So this is just real quick. Put them up 10 to 15 feet high. They should be black or at least very dark gray in our area. You can do some experimenting because big brown bats like it a little bit cooler. So you can get a variety of bats um, by having different colors or putting it in slightly different locations depending on the temperature. It needs to be grooved and rough inside for their little claws to hang on to it. And it really needs to face southeast. It should be on an open pole like this one is shown. And that is because so many people put them on trees. Guess what happens with trees? It gets shady, it doesn't get hot enough, and plus Bat Conservation International has found that bats don't even find them as frequently as they are on a pole. That's just something that they found during their research. And it's best to have a, a bat box that has a little landing pad underneath because when they come, it's kind of neat if you ever watch one, they'll fly in and they'll actually tuck their tail and land with their little hind feet and then climb up in. So they don't go head first into a bat box, they kind of curl up and under. And that's how they catch insects, too. This is a peak inside of an active bat box. And you can see all those little brown guys in there. Those are bats. There's a couple hundred in this little box. So they're very tiny, and they don't need much space. And they will reward you with eating all those insects. And plus, they're so much fun to watch. Their acrobatics are just unbelievable. And this just goes to show the difference between a painted box and an unpainted box. If you don't paint it, it's going to be pretty low, and if you paint it right, it's going to get up there. And if you live in different parts of the state, you might want to have, uh, if you live in the south, for instance, you're not going to want to paint your box black because of the ambient temperature during the season. Any questions on that? Just thought I'd throw in the bat talk because they're, they're just a very great uh, species to attract, and they are one that's common but in decline. And there are lots of, there are several endangered species of bats in our area as well. Well, it depends on where, where you're living at. You don't actually have to have a, an, any acreage at all if you've got some habitat nearby. Bats are most likely attracted to boxes that are placed within a quarter of a mile of a body of water. So if you have a pond or a stream or such within a quarter mile, you have a pretty good chance of attracting bats. It should be placed in an open area that has some trees. Oh, I, I forget the exact yardage, but like 50, 100 yards away. So there should be some mature trees close by, but, but not exactly where your bat box is at. So if you live in a typical neighborhood where you have backyard trees and such, and you have a little pond nearby, great place to have it. Um, you can find some bats living in some pretty urban areas, even downtown, mostly the big brown bats. They're actually, some of them live in, in the old buildings downtown. Too. But, uh, so it depends on what's around you. Yes? Black stain is what we use. We actually can get stain made up at Lowe's that's black, and you just paint it. No, you just paint the outside of it. You don't paint the inside. You make sure the inside's all nice and grooved, and you actually put like a little piece of, uh, I have plans if you want them, uh, roofing on top to shed the moisture off. It needs to be dry and warm inside, but you don't have to paint the inside, just the outside, and it doesn't affect it. And if you don't paint the outside, then it's not waterproof enough, and it falls apart. <laughs> uh, yeah, did you have a question, Jim? Oh, 10 to 15 feet is ideal. That's the hardest part. Getting them up there. <laughs> what about predators? Predators uh, generally aren't too much of a problem. Uh, this one here, you can see, has little predator guards on it, which is just like metal piping baffles there to prevent anything from trying to climb up, like snakes or raccoons. Uh, but they generally don't have too much problem with with that, not in your bat boxes. They have a huge problem outside of mines and caves where they're flying out at night and cats, feral cats, will hang out on the rocks right outside and learn that all these bats are coming through and they'll just put their paw out and catch them. You go to these mines where, you, where we do surveys and such and you'll look and you'll just see piles of bat wings, literally, from feral cats eating them. So that's one great thing you can do for wildlife is keep your cat indoors if you have one run, running around. All right. Any other questions on bats? I could talk all night about them, so I won't. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, uh, well, let's go now to um, buffers. We've talked a little about buffers around uh, wetlands 
And I think you all are pretty well versed because you have some projects around here dealing with riparian buffers that you've done. So I won't spend too much time on it other than to tell you that you have to keep that in mind in a park as well. Uh, here is a nice forested buffer. Once again, it depends on the slope. And uh, you know, if you have a steep slope, you should have a, a larger, wider buffer because of all that erosion that's going to take place. But if you have a nice flat area, you can have a smaller buffer, 50 foot or so, and it'll still do the right thing. And what do buffers do? Why are they important? Well, we know they attract wildlife. There's, a, once again, whole suites of species that will live only in riparian corridors, such as there's certain songbirds that, that will live only in those corridors. Uh, they're also good for providing hiding places for different types of animals to hunt from, such as herons and, and others. And they'll provide also shade over the water. Why is that important? To keep the water temperature down for lots of cold water species, which we don't have a whole lot of right around here. We don't have any great trout streams, uh, or they're stocked trout streams. We're not fortunate like they are in the middle of Pennsylvania where they have these nice limestone fed springs that stay cool all around. So shading is very important around here to provide even just for hardly any fish in, in our particular area. And let's see, oh, there are also some very big environmental benefits to buffers. Even if you don't care about wildlife, there are some great benefits. One, flooding. If you have a nice buffered stream, that's going to present or at least help assist with flooding problems. Why? Because when the water overflows its banks, those trees are there, the roots can suck up a lot of that water, and you present problems. Uh, that's why that soccer field I told you about, it didn't used to flood nearly as bad as it does now, but that's because they cut down all the mature trees right around it, and voila, you have flooding problems. It also, at the tree roots, actually also act as filters for pollutants. You're mowing your lawn, there's pollutants coming off. You spill, accidentally spill some oil, you've got some pollutants in your driveway, it rains, <coughs> those flow down through the groundwater, through the surface water or the groundwater, and end up into the stream. So the tree roots can actually filter those out or trap them, at least. And sediment is the same thing. If you have an area that somebody just is putting up a housing development and you see those all over the place, that's going to get washed down into the streams and trees and vegetations and shrubs can help trap that sediment before it gets to the water and makes it all cloudy and muddy and so forth. So they provide very uh, important benefits environmentally, not only for wildlife, but, but for our health as well. Okay. A good example of a buffer that I didn't talk about was how many of you are familiar with prairie potholes? A few of you, okay. We don't live out in the Midwest, so I didn't expect you all to be, but if you're duck hunters or anything, you're probably pretty familiar with it. Prairie potholes are basically just depressions of water out in the middle of the, of the prairies in, in the Midwest, in Dakotas and other areas as well. And they're a, just a breeding ground for ducks. Most of the state's duck production comes from these prairie pothole regions. And the government has figured out, and Ducks Unlimited and other groups have figured out, if we want to protect the ducks, we can't just protect the little bodies of water we have to protect a big buffer around it because that's where most of the ducks are actually nesting. So buffers around these bodies of water are very important because guess what? Ducks aren't going to nest in the middle of the water. They're going to nest on the ground beside it and they're going to need that water. So that's a good example to, uh, to show that. Okay, I just wanted to tell you about a resource that we have, a project that we've done that hopefully you guys can use called Backyard Buffers. We helped uh, put in several riparian buffers that are demonstrations to homeowners about what you can do in your own backyard. And I've got brochures here and you can take a whole bunch. And this is geared towards just Joe Schmo down the street who might have a stream in their yard to say, hey, what is a buffer? Why should I care about it? Okay, maybe I care about it. Now what do I do? And it has a list of species that are native to, South, to Allegheny County and Washington County actually that are found along waterways. So uh, and it provides a little bit about why they're beneficial and it links to our website and you can click on the pictures of each and every plant and so forth. So it's a neat little tool that we try and get out to everybody to get them to understand what are buffers and why you should care about them. So our website is on, is on that uh, brochure as well. And we'll do workshops for that too in conjunction with it at these demonstrations. And we found they're very, very 
important. And if you, even if you don't care about wildlife and you have water in your backyard, I hear so many people say, oh, I don't know what to do with that stream in my backyard. And so we try and help them out. We say, well, you, you know what? You can plant these species. You can plant chokeberry, buttonbush, uh, different types of dogwoods that are going to thrive in that type of habitat that's wet in the spring and not wet later. And they've been trying to plant things that don't belong there and they don't do well. So even from a landscaping perspective, it's good to know what belongs there because that's going to that's going to help you in the long run. This is a, I thought it was a rather nice backyard buffer. I don't think they realized I took the picture of it. <laughs> I went around for so long trying to find a picture of a good demonstration of a buffer in somebody's backyard. I couldn't find one. Most of them, if they had a stream, they mowed right up to the edge or it was filled with Japanese knotweed. <laughs> and Japanese knotweed is something I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's a terrible invasive exotic plant. It looks like it's got these big gigantic stalks like bamboo or something and big heart-shaped leaves and it's it's nutty. There's a picture of invasive plants up here. You can come see it if you didn't. And I finally found one. This is out in Ohio. And it's not a very wide buffer at all, but it it's nicely demonstrates what a buffer should be about. It has mature trees, pretty mature trees. It's actually got some shrubs, which serve as that second layer in the forest. And then it's actually got wildflowers along the, the floor of this bank. So it's, uh, and then you can see the person's lawn right next to that. So even this little buffer in this teeny tiny stream is helping keep chemicals, pollutants, sediment, so forth out of there and providing nice places for the wildlife to hang out. Buffers solve problems. I already told you about flooding, pollutants. There's some other things too. You've all seen, I've, you have a golf course right there, right? You all have geese come onto your golf course in, a, in numerous quantities. <laughs> Geese love mowed areas. They lo the only thing they love more than mowed areas is a mowed area right up to the water's edge. And so that's great goose habitat. Uh, but as you know, geese, uh, most of these geese are non-migratory geese, and they've done quite well. And they, they like that because they can see predators coming. There's no way a fox is going to ca catch them off guard, or a dog or a person is going to catch them off guard. And they like, they're grazers. They graze on that shortly clipped grass. That's yummy to them. And if you took that same area and let a strip, a buffer, grow up around it, you're going to find that the geese are going to stop using it or reduce using it. In most cases, I found they pretty much stop using it. So it solves yourself a problem there that's actually man made. Golf courses have this problem all the time. And we tell them, hey, create some buffers, it'll help you out. Also, one thing I thought about, it's, uh, it works, is if you have water on a park and you want to kind of prevent kids from going down and splashing in it or getting hurt, whatever, having a liability there, if you have a buffer of grown up vegetation around it, whether it's planted or you just stop mowing it, you're going to provide a barrier that's going to discourage people and kids especially from going down there. Therefore, you're, you're saving yourself on some liability issues. So if you think creatively, these things can be very, uh, very important to what you're doing. Okay. Implications, uh, just design your wetlands properly, include buffers for any b water body, control those invasives, do some simple things like creating islands, undulating shorelines, nesting structures. We didn't talk about wood duck boxes or the duck nesting tubes, but those are some other things that you can do and include bat boxes as well. Very simple things that you can do, and it's not going to detract from your experience at that park if you do it smart, and it's also not going to detract from the wildlife there. A lot of these species that we have living right here, they're not endangered. There, there are a few, but in this type of, you know, kind of highly suburbanized area, we've got wildlife that has learned to live alongside people pretty easily. So. If you do it wisely and don't put the soccer field right up against the wetland, you can have homes for, for everybody. I'm not going to talk too long about forests, uh, but just to mention that the same thing applies for forests as well. What do you want in a woodland? If you have forests on your property, you want diversity. And once again, the biggest culprit to lack of diversity are your invasive plants. Uh, garlic mustard is a big one on the forest floor. That's a little flower. She's probably on here. Yes, she's on here, garlic mustard right there. And all the way up to shrubs such as buckthorn, to trees like tree of heaven, Atlantis. 
these are species that were brought over, did so well, and they will take over and smother or prevent native species from coming in. They have very little, if any, wildlife value. So that's probably your biggest issue to, to tackle is invasive species. And unfortunately, also deer. Uh, we have an over, I know this is probably a hot topic for you guys, so I won't go into it too much, other than to say it's true that deer overpopulation will impact all your plant species that are coming up, and the forests are no different. Uh, garlic mustard oftentimes comes in when deer have uh, eaten away the layers. There's all sorts of wildflowers that should be on the forest floor. Deer will eat them when there's too many deer. They'll also eat the shrubs. It's not good for the deer because the deer don't have enough food to keep them healthy, and it's not good for the other wildlife, such as the songbirds, who nest in those shrubs and those other layers of the woods. So deer monitoring to see if you have a problem, and then deer management is very important to get at a truly uh, healthy ecosystem. Okay, now the best woods, and I guess it depends on who you're talking to, are the best woods, right? The best woods should have large, uninterrupted tracts of land, 100, 200 acres or more. Those are the best types of forests for what are called interior forest breeding songbirds, such as wood thrushes, a number of warblers, uh, a lot of other types of songbirds as well. But that's not too common around here. So if you have a large chunk of woods like that, by all means, try and protect it because it's very, uh, it, it, we're losing them everywhere. If you can find ways to connect corridors between one 50-acre plot and a 100-acre plot, by all means, try and find a way to maintain that corridor or create a corridor where wildlife and songbirds and such can uh, freely intermingle between these patches. We have to find ways to connect our fragmented habitats, whether it be forest or meadow or whatnot. And I don't have enough time to go into why it's so important for these birds, but uh, once again, it has to do with um, different types of species, such as cowbirds and such, that will that live along the edges of forest. And the smaller type of woods you have, the more edges you have, and they, they're closer into the birds, and they actually parasitize the birds and so forth. So big chunks of forest are great. Well, I'm working with uh, Jan over at Alcoa Technical Center, and they've got 2,000 some acres, most of which is forest. So we're trying to work with them to help conserve that for migratory birds because that is kind of rare in our, in our area. But then you might talk to a woodcock person who is going to say the best type of woods is an early wood, one that was just cut down and is now maybe 80 years later is reverting back to forest and it's nice and shrubby. And for the woodcock, that is the best type of forest. So I have to, to be careful about, about what I say the best type of forest is, but all has to do with what you're managing for. But in general, large tracks are very important. Um, and the diversity is important. You should have your canopy layer, which are your mature trees, then an understory of shrubs, which this is where a lot of the soft mass is at, the berries for all the songbirds and the wildlife, and then the actual forest floor, which should not be covered in garlic mustard, and it shouldn't just be barren in most cases. In most woods, it will be covered with wildflowers, ferns, native grasses and rushes that would live there normally and provide pollen for pollinators and berries and so forth, as well as it looks great. But as you know, that isn't the case too many places. Have any of you been to Raccoon Creek State Park? Good. That's a great place to go in April and May because you will see what the forest floor could look like in this area. Um, and it's absolutely, whoops, you were telling me I was talking too long ago. What's that, is that my computer that's there? You think so? I think so. <laughs> Somebody went to sleep. <laughs> Peter, into the microphone. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just. Uh, the question was about priority when you're managing for different, essentially groups of species. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about migratory songbirds requiring uh, interior habitat versus edge species like woodcock, and uh, how do you make a decision about? Uh, what, what you manage for given a limited quantity of land. Yeah, that's a great question, and you'll get some biologists, you know, fighting it over, <laughs> duking it out over some of these questions because sometimes there isn't an easy answer. What you do is you look at it on a landscape level in general. So let's just take an example. Let's say you have a park right here that's, um, I don't know, how, park, how big is your park? 500 acres. Okay. 
of that, that's kind of typical of what we work with, like at Bear Corporation 300, PPG 300. Look at what's around you. And look at what's on the site. Those are the two big things that you do. Look at what's around you. Is it all housing development? Are there any other green spaces nearby? Are there any other woods nearby? Does there a stream come through there that you can help restore? And maybe that would be the focal point of a bit about what you're doing. Is there a big wetlands on site? Which there is. Uh, that would be the first thing. Look at how it fits into the bigger picture. Because, okay, here's a good example. I love meadowlarks. I love grassland nesting songbirds. Etc. Right. Well, uh, if you only have 20 acres of grassland, a contiguous block of grassland, theoretically, you could attract meadowlarks and bobolinks, which are birds that nest on the ground and only in grassland areas, because bobolinks need five acres minimum of land to nest in on the ground. Meadowlarks need 20 acres. But if that 20 acres of grassland, which theoretically could support these species, is in the middle of a big development with no other grasslands nearby, or let's say just mostly woods nearby, you're not going to be able to attract that suit of species. So in that case, you might want to say, are there woods nearby? Maybe we should leave this as an opening for some wildlife, and we can create a little bit of, we can do some replanting as well. Or you could say, let's use this as a demonstration and educate people through this park and create some wildlife habitat as well. It's not going to impact the endangered upland sandpiper who needs 200 acres, but it's still going to do some darn good and it's going to attract wildlife. You can also attract wildlife, which I'm um, my next one, like pollinators. Small wildlife that are in the decline that are just as important as the, what's the big word? The uh, charismatic megafauna. Have you ever heard that term? <laughs> charismatic megafauna, grizzly bear, wolf bald eagle, big animals that everybody loves. And uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to get people excited about that squirrel corn, that wildflower up there, because it's certainly not megafauna, it's not charismatic either. Oh, this is from Raccoon Creek State Park, by the way, in the spring. Okay, so that gets into a good question. Here's, we're gonna talk about meadows and fields because I think this is where, um, oh, I'm gonna need to hurry up too. I think this is where we can do a lot. If you have lawn on your property, if you have turf in your park, if you have turf in your golf course, which of course you do, or on your anywhere, you can do something better than that uh, if you choose to. Because turf and lawn is basically, it's pretty much impermeable. It's got, I think, 90% permeability. It's, it's, it's almost like concrete. It's the next best thing to concrete, essentially, because that those cool seeding grasses form a mat like that. And when water hits it, it doesn't penetrate as much as it would if it was, uh, let's say, a meadow or a forest or whatnot. And it kind of seeps low. The water just seeps off of it into your waterways, onto the pavement, onto your roads, so forth. You hear a lot about this with stormwater runoff, which is a whole other two, three hours. Um, so that's what turf does, besides the fact that it is a desert for wildlife. Maybe desert's the wrong word to use. It is, a, it is dead to wildlife, essentially. If you have a nice, tight, cropped lawn, you're not going to see much going on there. You're not going to see many butterflies. You're not going to see much other than maybe some rabbits eating a little bit. But even then, you might not have rabbits because the rabbits like the clover and the plantain and the other types of things that should grow up there that don't. So turf, environmentally speaking, is, 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 is bad. Um, and we know that we can't all convert you guys to get rid of your lawns and put in a nice ecological landscape. We know that, that's fine. But there are things that you can do on the park and in your backyard that are somewhere in between wild and wooly and a well-manicured lawn. Um, so this is actually a picture from PPG Monroeville. We put in a, uh, what we call pollinator habitat called Monarch Meadows. And I'll talk a little bit about that as an example. But this is what a tall grass prairie would look like. It's not a turf grass, it's not full of weeds. These are switchgrass and other types of wildflowers that would uh, grow normally before people came in and introduced all the sorts of plant species that were there. So I was talking about pollinators and demonstrations and small critters. Um, pollinators are so very important. Why are they important? Does anybody know why pollinators are critical and are worth our attention? Bees, why? Food crops. 
That's right, over $40 billion annually, thanks to pollinators. $40 billion annually. So even economists argue <laughs> that pollinators are worth protecting. When you go eat lunch tomorrow, one out of three bites you take, thanks to a pollinator. Apples, oranges, yes, oranges, blueberries, even uh, cotton, my favorite, chocolate. Chocolate, cacao, and the cacao flower is actually pollinated by a tiny, tiny fly called a midge. So that's one good thing flies can do, is create chocolate. So pollinators are extremely important to us for economically. They're also important to ecosystems. Oops, touching my microphone. They're also important to ecosystems because, let's say you like songbirds. You don't care about bees. Well, guess what a lot of those songbirds eat? They eat berries. They're going to eat the spice bush berries, the dogwood berries, viburnum berries. Those berries just didn't happen. A lot of them are pollinated only by insects. So when the bee goes from one flower to the next flower to the next flower, he transfers pollen, which allows fertilization to occur, creating the seeds and the berries, therefore creating the food for the songbirds and the other types of animals that depend upon it. So there's nothing stands alone. And those little bees that you swatted at all the time thinking, oh, I hate those sweat bees. They're actually very important little solitary bees um, that you can thank for a lot of things, such as this little guy right here. We talked about solitary bees. They're the most, most of the time we think of honeybees, right? That's that one right down there. Honeybees are actually introduced from Europe. There's a lot of controversy over as to whether they're bad or good, but, but let's just say they're okay. <laughs> they're good. They're, they're, depends on who you ask, but they haven't um, hurt other species of bees to any huge extent that people would say wipe out the honeybees. Depending on who you ask, they'd say different things. But uh, there's lots of bees that are native. That first little bee on that other picture was one of the solitary bees. There's many different types. Most of them don't even have common names because only scientists look at them and care about them. But they're there, and that's what's important to know. Bumblebees are great. Oh, I just love bumblebees. They are actually, they do live socially like honeybees, but they don't store honey over winter because the entire hive dies out except for one queen. So guess what that means to you and me? They're very, very unlikely to sting you because they're not protecting a huge source of food. They will sting you if you step on them or if you hurt them, but I actually get a hive every year for a school program, and I can tell you I lift up that lid and throw in the pollen, and they just kind of buzz. They don't sting me. They don't do anything. So most bees are very, very uh, innocuous critters. And the honeybees, because they have a big hive of honey to protect, they're more likely to sting you. And wasps, like yellow jackets and such, are more likely to sting you, and they're not actually what we're talking about here. Uh, if you have tomatoes, you'll want to have bumblebees around because they, they're the best pollinator for tomatoes for a, a pretty cool reason, but I, I won't have time to get into that. Leaf cutter bees, see there's a little bee on that first one. That's a type of bee, and this is in my front garden. It has some native plants in there that attract them. And even the small spaces can attract a lot of these pollinators. In fact, small spaces are good for the pollinators because a lot of these guys only travel couple hundred yards, they have to find their food, shelter, water, and space within a couple hundred yards. And so we can do something. And they are declining. And guess what? They're not getting the attention that the big uh, other creatures that are a little more fuzzy and huggable get. So very important. Beetles. Beetles are actually one of the biggest pollinators. And we have so many beetles. Uh, it's, it's kind of neat. This is a very pretty one, so just wanted to to make you aware of that. Moths are pollinators too. Butterflies are pollinators. This is a sphinx moth or a hummingbird moth. There's a couple different names for it. And they actually fly during the day. And have any of you ever seen one before? You say, oh, that's a hummingbird. And they're like, no, it's not. <laughs> so that's a moth. And just represents a lot of the different moths that do their pollinating at night. And even some bats. In this area, we don't have any pollinating bats. Fruit bats are the ones that pollinate uh, down in the southwest. Mexico, <coughs> Central South America, Asia, so forth. But we should be aware that they're very important pollinators. And if you like tequila, <laughs> you're going to have to like the fruit bat. OK, so we understand. We like pollinators. We should try and protect them. We can do this anywhere. We can do this in a pocket park, uh, whatever. And it can have big impacts, especially education-wise. But, but it is very important. OK, what can we do? Well, we can restore meadows. We can take a lawn area and we can actually actively manage it for native plants. 
or we could stop mowing an area. You're going to have to monitor and see what comes up because you might get a lot of invasives that are causing problems and you might want to get those out of there. So you can stop mowing, you can take an active restoration project, and you could even do something like a demonstration garden. This is great for around landscaping. If you have to have a more formal area, you can use native plants and make a real nice, attractive looking thing. In fact, what I usually advocate is do both. Do a formal garden up front wherever it has to look, you know, manicured, <laughs> and then have signs up there saying, this is Joe Pie Weed, it attracts blah, 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 and it's great for this reason. This is switchgrass, it is blah, blah, blah. And then have those same species planted in a nice, wild, natural area in the back, maybe along the edge of the woods, way back off the road, whatnot. So you get two things for your money. You get the habitat, and you also get the, uh, the uh, outreach component of that. Native plants, as many of you probably know, also are better suited to our conditions. They're better suited to our soil, if you pick the right one. They're better suited to our weather conditions, our rainfall, and therefore they require less maintenance. You don't have to go out there and water them. The first year it's usually a good idea to, but after that you don't have to, uh, unless you have a pretty severe drought, you don't have to put a lot of chemicals on. In fact, you shouldn't put chemicals on them. Why shouldn't we use pesticides if we're attracting pollinators? because we're going to kill them. That's right. So you might have some aphids over here, but uh, if you spray, you're going to kill the monarch caterpillars that are feeding on that milkweed. So what do you do? Here's a situation where you try and let nature take its course. You can do something like integrated pest management where you can actually go in there and just spray the aphids off with a hose. You could pick bugs off, or you can also let other insects eventually come into play. There's all these parasitic wasps and strange things. There's this bizarre world out there in the insect world that we know nothing about until you start looking at. And if you let them do their thing, they're going to kind of control one another naturally. But if you spray, you're going to have more pests than you do the good stuff because those pests rapidly multiply and say, oh, no, I'm getting sprayed. I've got to multiply more and take over. Where at, and the parasitic wasps and the other types of insects that would naturally control them never have the chance to, to build up to a population level high enough to take care of them. So that was integrated pest management 101 <laughs> in two seconds. How's that? <laughs> OK, so you don't want to use chemicals. You don't want to use pesticides. Now, whenever we're establishing meadows, oftentimes we have to use herbicides. Herbicides kill plants. Pesticides kill pests or insects or other animals, too. The only herbicide that we ever use, there's two, Roundup in upland areas and Rodeo or Accord in wetland areas. And those are used by most restoration ecologists because you can try doing different methods and it could work, but sometimes you get to situations where your project isn't going to succeed unless you kill off those invasive plants. So that's what we do. Um, so knowing what you're doing, why you're doing it, is this the only way to do it? That's, you have to ask yourself these questions. We never apply pesticides ever um, because that will just wipe out what we're trying to do. Next are plants, are native species of plant, well, should be native species of plants, sometimes they're not, that uh, provide nectar for pollinators. Hummingbirds, I didn't mention hummingbirds, they're a pollinator as well. Um, a lot of these plants will also provide seeds for birds later on. The goldenrod, for instance, you always see chickadees picking off the seeds at the end of the season. Uh, so these are important, they provide the nectar for adult butterflies and other pollinators. Those are some very common ones that you can find around here. Number two, however, host plants. If you want to attract butterflies in particular, which most of us do, and how do you do that? You can attract them to visit with nectar plants. The adults will stop by. But if you want them to come home, take their shoes off, and stay a while, you should plant host plants. Different species of butterflies have specific needs for plants. In other words, they will only lay their eggs on certain types of plants because their caterpillars can only eat certain types of plants. Monarch butterfly. Somebody has to know what its host plant is. Milkweed, that's right. And uh, in this previous picture, you saw the common milkweed up there. You also saw butterfly weed, another type of milkweed. They're all in the Asclepias family. In this particular picture, this is at PPG Monrova once again, this is swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata, which generally goes in wet, grows in wetland areas. You'll see it growing alongside cattails. But it'll also grow in upland areas, too, if you want to plant it, which is what we did here. Why? Because we knew the monarchs seemed to really prefer this particular species of milkweed. 
And so we started them from seed, and that's the milkweed plants. So nothing but about 600, 800 milkweed plants that one employee started in the pool room at PPG. And there you can see we're using it for education. And here in the corner, you can see the little monarch caterpillar is about to metamorphosize into his chrysalid and turn into a butterfly later on. So the host plant is very important. Monarch butterflies, it's milkweed. Other types, it's other ones. Um, let's see, tiger swallowtail, for instance, use cherries. Uh, there's sassafras is a host plant for quite a few species. There is turtle head is a host plant for, and we have a picture of turtle head. Right there, it looks like a little turtle head. That's a host plant for the Baltimore pepper spot. Um, what else am I missing? There's quite a few. Violets. Violets are host plants for the fritillaries, which are very common butterflies. So these are all things you've got to realize. If you don't have those species, you're missing out on one of the aspects of the, the needs of these particular types of wildlife. Even if he's tiny, it doesn't have to be big. You still have to meet those four needs. So host plants can really do a lot to increase your biodiversity in a park and it's very easy to do. Okay, and I talked about, y you can go from anywhere from natural to manicured. On the left, that's my septic field out where I live. It's planted in the native mix of uh, grasses. But granted, where I live, you know, I can do that. Where you live, you might not be able to get away with it. Um, and on the right-hand side is a garden outside of a school. Once again, using a lot of the same species in the left-hand picture. You can think of it as a continuum. You know, you have the wild areas and you have the formal areas, and if you can move people, start to move people along that continuum towards what is ecologically healthy, then you're doing something good. Oh, this is just another picture of the Wings of Wonder Meadow. This is the short grass prairie. You can see those golden rods growing. There's lots of different types of species. Find what you like and what works for you or what might work in your park. Um, there's even cultivated varieties of golden rod that you can put in your garden. Fireworks is one example. It looks like fireworks. So there's all sorts of uh, ways to do this. You don't have to go uh, all hog wild like, like I did. <laughs> okay. And these areas, like I said, even the smallest areas speak a lot for education if you use it properly. At PPG, through our Wings of Wonder project, we have partnered with an educational partner called ACET who helps us recruit and train teachers on how to use this meadow not to go out and, ooh, let's do some activities, you know, activities for activity's sake. No, to actually get out there and do science, actually help the teachers reform their ways of teaching science. The kids actually go out and conduct investigations in the meadow. They take out their little journal and they note what they observe, these plants to look like. They note what insects are coming to them and they begin to think like a scientist, question, observe, and figure out ways to investigate the natural world around them. Most importantly, right in their backyard. But we know nothing stands alone. So we want to get them out there in the backyard, realize we've got a really cool ecosystem right here. But then we also partner them up with a PPG site in Mexico and Mexican teachers and students where the monarch butterfly overwinters to and get them to connect the local picture to the global picture. So they realize, oh, okay, what I do in my backyard is important for the monarch, but if we don't take care of the other issue, what happens in Mexico where they overwinter, we're going to lose the monarch, right? So this is a very simple story using one strand in the big web to teach a very big concept that a lot of us still have trouble with. And so even the small places can have big impacts that way. Other things you can do, we forgot about shelter. Shrubs and trees nearby provide windbreak. They'll also pl provide areas where the butterflies and pollinators and other critters are going to hang out. But uh, bee blocks, like that one in the back, don't put up a butterfly box, put up a bee block. It's, it's basically a big block of wood. You can use old wood and drill holes in it. That provides an area for the solitary bees to lay their eggs and have their, their babies pupate and turn into baby bees. <laughs> that is not the scientific term. Um, but you get what I'm saying. So that's a very important thing uh, to do, to provide that shelter. You can also create bumblebee homes. Sometimes it's as easy as turning over an old pot, an old potted pot in a shady area, putting some cotton in it, and attract bumblebees. Uh, so there's some neat things that you can do that, are, uh, that will help pollinators and show the food, shelter, water, and space aspects of it. Puddles are very easy. This was actually taken down in Mexico in Michoacan when we took the teachers from PPG down to Mexico to meet our counterparts that we're working with. So you're not going to see 
hundreds of monarchs like this in a puddle, but you will see uh, lots of butterflies in a puddle, particularly um, in an opening in the forest or such, you'll see this. So puddles, wet soil uh, are very important for butterflies. So if you have a park, if you have a little out of the way area, don't feel like you need to have everything covered in turf or grass or something because lots of times those little niches are very important, just like the vernal pools are to the herp or the salamander uh, frog. The puddles are very important for butterflies. Okay, what can you take back for your park? You can reduce the mowing around the edges. You can reduce mowing in strategic areas. We worked with Bear Corporation's campus. They wanted it to look real nice, right? Well, they now reduce, they have reduced mowing on over 20 acres on their property. They have found ways that, hey, it won't detract from our image. It's gonna be great for wildlife. Now they have more turkey than ever. They've got an active bluebird population. You can restore meadow in large chunks. The bigger the chunk, the better, of course. But even in small areas can, can be important. Use native species to this area. Uh, make sure you research it carefully. And we've done a lot of that through our projects too because there are species that are native to Ohio that aren't native to Pennsylvania and so forth. And it can get tricky trying to figure out what's what. And sometimes if you make the wrong choice, as long as it's not invasive, you're not, you know, in the big picture, you probably haven't done anything wrong. There's a saying, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt that said, the best action to do is the right thing. The next, next best thing to do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing to do is nothing at all. So don't get, be too paralyzed. You have to, to try and do your best. Use, for buffers, you can use meadows as buffers for bodies of water if you can't plant trees and shrubs. You can use areas that aren't mowed as buffers as well. You should control those invasive plants. You can think about demonstration gardens in areas that should be or must be formal because somebody wants it that way. <laughs> um, you should eliminate or reduce chemical use. Know why you're doing it. Know what's going on. If you're working with the township and have know somebody on the maintenance crew so you can know what they're doing. And Think about managing those deer, at least monitoring and definitely managing if you can, because guess what? You can plant that whole thing, but it'll get munched down if you don't. At the PPG Meadow, we put up an electric fence around it because it's 300 acres in the middle of Monroeville and all the deer live there. And uh, it successfully kept the deer out. The fence got struck by lightning this summer. They didn't realize it for a few weeks. And the deer went in and they promptly chomped first all the asters, then the silk, and then this, then that. Um, but they didn't touch the tall grass prey, which had a lot of switchgrass and such in it because that kind of protected it. So that, that's a reality in dealing with things. Okay, and I know I'm over my time here, so I'm just going to wrap up. Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> all right. I don't mean to keep it late, I know. The last thing is you have areas that are more formal. Um, you can do some things with that as well. I told you about the gardens, but you could also do bluebird trails. Bluebirds actually like areas that are mowed because they can hunt there easily. Um, not necessarily tightly mowed, but they do prefer that type of habitat. So bluebird trails are excellent ways to, um, to get in some more species that you might not have otherwise. Their big limiting factor besides habitat, which is everybody. If they have the open space, grassy fields, they like golf courses, corporate campuses, you know, nice open fields. Um, if they don't have the cavities, Remember those dead trees I showed you? They don't have the cavities to nest in because that's the only thing they will nest in. They won't nest on their shelf like a robin will. They won't nest on the ground like a meadowlark or in a tree. They need the cavities. And luckily, this is a su success story. Uh, people put up large amounts of bluebird shells, I believe it was in the 60s, and actually helped the comeback of this species. So uh, it's something that is, it's simple. It sounds too simple to be true, but it works. Bear now fledges over 100 bluebirds off their campus when before they never saw one, just because they put up and they monitored bluebird shells. Other species you can attract, tree swallows, one of my favorites. I, got, I love the tree swallows, I think, more than the bluebirds. Um, and they particularly like near water. And they'll, they're eat insects galore as well. Chickadees and wrens, if you put up a nest box along the edge of the woods or in the woods, you're gonna get chickadees or wrens. So depending on where you put the nest box and the nest box specifications, that will dictate what type of species you get. But that's important to know because I've seen lots of people, I can't get a bluebird, and I go over and it's on the edge of the woods and they have wrens in there. So, And some species need your help more than others. Wrens, um, the house wrens and Carolina wrens, they don't need your help quite as much. It's okay to, to have them around, 
Um, and it's okay to put up nest boxes specifically for them, but the bluebirds and tree swallows um, can, are a little bit uh, further down on the list. They're actually a level three species of concern to part nation flight, so there's some things you can do. And here's an adult male eastern bluebird and a nest. Their nests are very compact grass. They're all made out of grass, and they either have blue or white eggs. Usually blue, but white eggs uh, do happen. This is a good area for them. Um, you can pair your bluebird boxes so that you won't have two bluebirds occupy each box, but you could have a bluebird and a tree swallow or a wren and something else, a uh, wren and a chickadee in there. So it's a great way to get more species, in other words and let the bluebirds move in because sometimes bluebirds are a little less aggressive than the tree swallows and the tree swallows will take over all your boxes if you have enough of them which you know is okay um, also it's important with predators somebody mentioned predators before about the bat boxes here is where you really should put predator guards up um, bear uses these they reuse these little funnels i don't know what they're for and they put them under there and they caulk them and it actually works because snakes will climb up the pole get in the box eat them raccoons will come up eat them cats will jump up all sorts of things like shady birds uh, and it's important to note that raccoons especially they're kind of smart if you put up a bunch of bluebird boxes on the fence line it's like a smorgasbord for them and once they learn it's there they're not going to forget and they will come down and they'll get boop, boop, boop. so you don't want to create a trap for your bluebirds uh, you want to create it as safe as possible and let's face it this bluebird box is not natural <laughs> it's not a tree in the middle of the woods and in reality, they wouldn't use the same nest over and over, but with bluebird boxes, they will use it over and over. So the raccoon knows, hey, free meal inside. So that's very important. You also must monitor it. We really can't advocate putting up bluebird boxes unless you're going to monitor it regularly. Once a week during the breeding season is best, but even if it's, you know, once every few weeks, that's good. And why do you want to monitor? You want to catch problems because you don't want to create a trap, like I said. You want to make sure that some predators aren't getting into it. You want to make sure you don't have problems with uh, uh, blowflies or other types of insects that will suck the blood out of the baby. You also want to see what's going on. It's fun. Why put up the bluebird box if you don't know if you're having success? You should do that. You should check it out. This is a baby bluebird, just a few days old. And each different each baby bird has a different look to it, so you can tell what type of species it is. Just like its nest, different birds make different nests. So you can tell a lot just by checking out the box, even if there aren't babies in there. And this is a tree swallow on her nest. It looks a lot like a bluebird nest, except she lines it with feathers. And those are tree swallow babies right there. And you might ask, uh, somebody usually always asks me, well, aren't you disturbing them if you go in there? Because I took these pictures, and I opened it up, stuck my big lens inside, and took the picture. And the truth of the matter is, you can touch the babies if for some reason they fall out, and you can pick them up and put them back in because birds have a very poor sense of smell. Turkey vultures have a good sense of smell of all the birds, <laughs> but other birds don't. So you can pick them up and put them in. They're not going to smell you. They're not going to even, I, you, they'll even see you lots of times handling the babies if you have to ban them or create, check a problem or something like that. And they will immediately go back because their mothering instinct is to take care of those babies when it comes to these birds and uh, they're not going to abandon them just because you touch them. In fact, North American Bluebird Society, Cornell University, everybody advocates monitoring your nest boxes. You're going to create more problems if you don't. So don't worry about them being afraid of you. Uh, just go in, do what you have to do, and get back out. You don't want to, you know, play with them or <laughs> whatever, uh, and it'll be, it'll be just fine. In fact, always one lesson I still always tell you before I I tell you nothing else, always tap on the box before you open it. You never know what's inside. Lots of times the bluebird or the swallow will fly out in your face, and whew, it's just surprising. But sometimes there's other things in the box. Flying squirrels are, are, are uh, one that uh, I've heard more than one person go to check their box, and a flying squirrel lands on their face, literally, because <laughs> she's scared and he's flying out. And Well, check your box. And knock. <laughs> knock first. That's right. So here's a chickadee nest if you're along the edge of the woods. Notice its nest is very different from the grass cup nest of the other one. It's got moss, little strips of bark, rabbit fur. That's always what I found, the moss and the rabbit fur. And here is the house sparrow. You heard me mention before about the invasive. The house sparrow is the one invasive species of birds that you must get to know 
and figure out what that nest looks like because if you get in house sparrow nests in your nest box, you should do something about it. You should either remove that nest, which you will quickly find, they keep building a new one, um, or trap that sparrow and relocate it, or you can kill it because it is actually not, it's, there's only a couple species that aren't protected by the Migratory Bird Act, and house sparrows are one of them, pigeons and starlings are the other ones, because they are not mated. So what you do is up to you. But in the long run, you'll probably want to move that nest box to somewhere else. House sparrows uh, usually are found near barns, outbuildings, schools. So you might want to put it out further from that building, and you'll solve yourself the problem there. There's a lot of other different ways of dealing with it, which you know, I don't have time to go into. So that's what their nest looks like. It's very, 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 very messy. And it usually has a piece of foil or plastic in it. Don't ask me why, but almost all the time you'll find that in there. So it's pretty obvious. And once you start monitoring a little bit, you'll find those things out. OK, well, the bottom line is, I don't know if any of you saw this Pennsylvania, this DCNR report that just came out yesterday. It was issued by uh, the Game Commission, DCNR, and the Fish and Boat Commission. They did a three-year study on uh, Pennsylvania's outdoor heritage. And they have discovered that the lands lost to development are three times greater in Pennsylvania than those being conserved. And we are estimated to lose around 120,000 acres each year, even though our population growth is relatively flat. So every single area that we have to protect is important. And that's basically what this report says as well. It actually says, let's protect the best of what remains. Let's restore and improve habitat. Let's work cooperatively with, pri work cooperatively with private landowners and uh, work with parks and other areas to protect our habitat. So active recreation may not be compatible with all types of wildlife, but it can be compatible with quite a bit. And biodiversity enriches our lives, not only with color and song, but also health. We learned about pollinators. We know that buffers can protect our water quality, keep us, that trees can sequester carbon and also protect our water quality. Biodiversity is something that we need to do in every niche, in every corner of our community and in our backyard. So I congratulate you guys on, on going forward with habitat planning in your parks and in your neighborhoods, and I thank you very much for inviting me here to, uh, to speak about this. Mm -hmm.